have been fine traveling with you, gentlemen. May our paths cross again. I'm sure they will, Mr. Dogan. Right. Ahead of schedule. That's the first time that's happened in years. Ahead of schedule? Yeah. Well, don't apologize. These things happen. It's been a bit of a dry trip. Would it be imposing for you to keep me luggage? No, not at all. I'll put it right over here and the agent will keep an eye on it for you. Now, this agent, would he know an inhabitant by the name of Benjamin Cartwright? Everyone around here knows the Cartwrights and the Ponderosa. Then he wouldn't mind telling Benjamin I'll be waiting for him in the saloon. Thank the both of you. Mm -hmm. Ah, <laughs> uh, Mr. Dugan. Would you like me to take care of that little black bag for you? Thank you, no. Greetings, gentlemen. Greetings. Yes, sir. I'll have something light, if you don't mind. <laughs> light, sir? What about three ounces of whiskey will be fine? That's light enough not to strain a man's arm. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's a pity for me to drink it all by myself. Set them up for everybody, will you? I'll smoke it, the boys. Uh, welcome to Virginia City, sir. Yes, you know, in my opinion, a friendly saloon is the crown of our entire civilization. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. All right, gentlemen, to the health and to the good fortune of everybody. Mm. It's excellent. It's excellent. <sighs> I always wanted to wear one of them fancy hats. I'm sorry, my friend, but uh, this was one time the property of the Honorable James Buchanan, who was the 15th President of the United States. I, I captured it, as you might say, at the great Democratic Convention of 1856. Is that supposed to mean that it's too good for the likes of me? No, not at all, at all. It's just uh, I have a fierce pride, you know, in being only the second man to wear the favorite hat of the 15th president. Well, let me warn you, mister. There's going to be a third. Take patience, will you? Nobody does that to me. Now, easy, Patrick. Nobody! <coughs> you hurt the little fellow. Now, you stop it. <coughs> you pick on someone your size. <coughs> Touche is the saying is. Now mind your manners. These things will happen, lads. Don't let it interrupt your drinking. O'Neill. O'Neill, sit down. Now just stay put, you're drunk. Let's not get into any fights. You're right where you are. Look at that, will you? Look at that. Nothing's changed. It's exactly the way we met 25 years ago. That's right, Oni. And I might have known I'd find you in the middle of a big fight. <laughs> oh, how are you, my boy? Just wonderful. It's good to see you. Now, we're going out to the Ponderosa. We've got a lot of talking over to do. Come on. Give me that little black bag there, will you? <laughs> Peace on earth, gentlemen. Oni, you know I might have known he'd be a friend of the high and mighty Ben Cartwright. It'd be a pleasure to kill them both. You're fine lads. Ah, yes, they are. Mr. Owen P. Dugan of New York City, meet my son, Hoss. Happy to have you here, sir. Little Joe. Pleasure to have you with us. We've heard a lot about you. And right behind him is the finest cook in the West, Hopsing. Now, I don't know if uh, Mr. Dugan owns Manhattan Island outright or just holds a long-term lease on it. <laughs> if I told you how long I'd known your father, you might discover he's been lying about his age. <laughs> <laughs> get Mr. Dugan's bag. Right, get <laughs> it's a very impressive place. Our home is your home. Stay a lifetime. It's just possible I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the wild, wild days. It's a shame. I tell you, lads, 
whenever there was trouble, you know, and, a, and a man needed a friend, there your father would be, like a tiger, like a tiger in the streets. <laughs> oh, don't pay too much attention to what he says. Every second word he utters is pure blarney. So am I saying too much? Am I giving away some <laughs> state secrets? <laughs> No, I am surprised that he has never told you about his youthful adventures, you know. Well, if only to educate you oh, along no. historic, what's the matter? Oh, yeah. And along Come cultural on. lines, Come huh? You know, it's funny because Paul's always been very quick with that cultural stuff, hasn't he, Joe? Oh, yeah. Of course, there may have been some cultural aspects that haven't slipped their mind, Paul. Some you didn't happen to mention to us. <laughs> oh, well, just let me tell you something. I'm not going to allow myself to be blackmailed in my own home by a wild, imaginative, loose-tongued Irishman. Well, you're lucky, because we're going to have to turn in. we got to get up early. Yep. See you in the morning. See only you good night. in the morning. Good night, only. Good night, Bob. Good night. Good night. I'm not fool with Tiger in street. <laughs> <laughs> Those are two fine lads. You're a lucky man. Ben. Oh, I know it. I know it. Tell me about your daughter, Julie. I was hoping you'd ask. i tell you one oh. thing. She is her mother, born again. Oh? Isn't she? Hmm? Oh, my. She's beautiful, honey. Beautiful. And she's living in San Francisco. Yes, I sent her there to school after her mother passed away. That's nine years ago. Mm. St. Rose's Academy. And now she's at the College of Sacred Heart. Well. And she is a lady to her fingertips. And you haven't seen her in all this time? No, I was all mixed up, you know, with my factories and steel mills and shipping interests. That's the way life goes, what with one thing or another. And that is why I'd like to settle here in the West. Not to be sitting on the poor girl's doorstep, exactly. But to be reasonably near in case she needed me. Like this area, for example. You know what I'd like? I'd like to invest in a business of some sort. Around here? Yes, like a racetrack in Carson City. Well, you know what I've always dreamed of doing? to own and operate the biggest saloon in the world. <laughs> I tell you, you'd make a fortune. <laughs> Only, I think your ideas are just a little too rich for people around here. Oh, there's some very good investments around here, very practical investments that could be made. Are you really serious? You see that bag over there? Huh? I'm at least that serious. You don't think I carry this bag around with me because I'm afraid somebody will steal my laundry, do you? There is $114,000 in this bag. It's the proceeds from a little brewery I sold in Boston. You're not joking. I never make that expensive a joke. Won't you take this and invest it for me? Me? Invest that for you? Oh, wait a minute. But I don't get the problem. We're both businessmen. I've been here for eight or nine hours. I've talked with both of your sons. It's as clear to me as a cow in a teacup that you are the number one citizen of Virginia City and you're a man so honest that it hurts all over. And what is the most important thing of all is after all, you're my closest and my best friend. Well? Now, look, only I... I have never been comfortable using other people's money, investing people. But I, I couldn't do it. I, I wouldn't know how to... There is a... There's a very good thing around here. I think we might be interested in this. What do you know about lumber? I guess it comes from trees. <laughs> but... <laughs> no, no, be serious now. No, there's a, a piece of land, a, a lumber tract, which I have an option on, and I refrained from exercising the option on. I didn't want to spread myself too thin. Now, if you're really serious about investing $100,000... Let's start. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute now, Oni. This is your money we're talking about, not mine. Now, you, you've got to know everything about this kind of operation. Now, if we were talking about entering into a pawn shop, we'll see, in the Bowery, well, then I'd expect you to take my advice. But here we are in your territory, and I'd be only too eager and too proud to take your advice. As simple as that? As simple as that. We're in business, right? Yes, I, <laughs> I guess we're in business, right? <laughs> Take it, count it, and put it in the safe. Only I... Right! <laughs> huh? <laughs> what was your name, Stakes? Duke and O'Reilly, who yes. Oh, what was your name? Ah, good morning, Hop Singh. I'm sorry. That I'm late for breakfast. That's all right, Mr. Tokin. 
Five more minutes, you late for dinner, too. <laughs> well, that's the wasteful, sinful habits of a lifetime. There's nothing you can do about it now. Where's everybody? Mr. Cartwright just come back from town. He in kitchen. Sit down. I'm fixing dinner. Very good. Well, well, you're not much of a family for lounging around in the morning, are you, Ben? I can't afford to. I just came from town. I just put you in the lumber business, lock, stock, and one hundred thousand dollars worth. Well, <laughs> oh, I listen. Never... It's a telegram for you. For me? Hmm? Say. That's from Julie. She's coming here to Virginia City. Well, that's great news. What's the matter, Henri? Aren't you pleased? Well, of course I am. It's just that I have no recollection of writing the lass and telling her that I was going to stop here on my way to San Francisco. Oh, but I did. I did, I remember now. I must be losing my memory in my old age. It's a very happy day for me, Ben. Oh, well, it's a happy day for all of us. Dinner is served. Come on, let's eat. Now, Ben, after dinner, you know what I like? I, I, I like to take a ride up and, and uh, look at me investment. Well, I'll ride up with you. No, if you'll just show me the way. I, I'd like to go alone. I suddenly got a bit of thinking to do. All right. There you are. Well, well, if it isn't the respectable member of the organization, only himself. Come in, come in. Greetings, children. Have you gotten any leads on putting some of the boodle into an honest business? That's why they sent me here, isn't it? I'm a silent partner in the lumber business with an old friend, Ben Cartwright. Fine, fine. We've heard the name mentioned since we've been here. He's a respected man. Listen, I'm going to see to it that his name stays respected. You'll do what you're told, and don't forget it. Don't threaten me, lad. I have a short Celtic temper. I'm not threatening you, only... But if you want your daughter to find out what you've been doing all these years, well, that's up to you. So it was you that sent her that telegram? Ah, just following orders, only Just following orders. Like you will. Am I right? You're sure right, lad. We'll expect another report soon. He'll stay alive. as we once knew it is changing. Is it not? For example, you remember Brooklyn? Yeah, 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 certainly. Now, there's talk of one day making Brooklyn a part of New York City. Really? Yes, it's as clear a case of joining a silk purse to a sow's ear as ever I've heard. <laughs> ah, look at that. to be lying to me. 
But thanks just the same. Any fool knows when his time has come. Now, you just be quiet. Bring some of this. It's like, it's like the Lord told Lucifer, you can't win them all. That's not a direct quotation, but I think it'll serve. Now, just stop me talking. Be quiet. No, I'm afraid I, I have to talk. There's something you should know. I am a man that is not worth your friendship. As I am a scoundrel and a cheat. The money I gave you it was never my own. It was booty and graft from Tammany Hall. And it was my job, you know, to, to invest it. One miserable bag of it with someone I, I could trust. Somebody who would make it seem legitimate. I don't despise me. It's in my deathbed. You know, if, it's true, but if I had my life to live over again, I'd be a different man, I tell you that. It's too late. I'm, I'd like to postpone this, I tell you. Because I had grand plans for my funeral. And I used to think, I used to think I'd have six black horses to haul the poor skin and bones that was left of me through the streets of New York. And I was, you promised me something. You promised me there won't be one word about my sins to, to Julie. I promise. Thank you. I'll do the same for you someday. Doc. He's a lucky man, Ben. The bullet didn't even reach a vital area. I think he's more scared than hurt. But give him some good care and rest. I think he'll be back on his feet in no time. Yeah, he'll get that. Good night. Good night, Doc. Thanks. Thank you. Come in. What's that for? I think you know. Oh, it's a terrible and humiliating thing for any man to survive his deathbed confession. <sighs> Only I can't use that money. Why can't you use it? Because I can't. It's not as though you stole it yourself. If I used that money, it would be exactly as if I'd stolen it myself. Oh, Ben. For heaven's sakes. When you thought you were dying, I heard you say with my own ears that you wished you had a chance to live your life over again. I did. Well, you have your chance now. How? What? Now, I, I don't want to be a conscience. But the thought occurred to me that if you really wanted another chance, you'd give back that money. You know, that that is the maddest statement that I've ever heard in my life. Why? Well, in the first place, politics is politics. And then no decent man would ever betray his fellow thief. And besides, it's not so easy as all that, you know. You can't look a crooked dollar in the face and you say, oh, this dime belongs to that construction job and this 15 cents belongs to the other. It's all mixed up. It's all part of the system. And then, in the long run, what does it matter? Well, it matters to me. Now, Ben, look, this lumber deal is already underway, and Haas is up there right this very minute. That's right. Well, you need the money. Yes, I do. Ben, my 
little girl Julie will be here in a few days. Eh? And you won't allow any of this to make any difference with Julie, will you? Oh, what do you think? Why, I, I think that you know she's the only good and decent thing in my life. And that I'd sooner die, for real, you know, than give her one moment of heartache. Dugan? Miss Julie Dugan? Yes. I'm Joe Cartwright. I've come to meet you. Well, you must be Ben Cartwright's son. That's How right. good of you to meet me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Where's father? Uh, your, uh, your father's waiting for us at the house. He, he had sort of an accident. Is he all right? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's fine. He's fine. We're a little worried about him for a time. He's up and around now like a nervous rooster. We almost had to tie him down to keep him home. I can hardly wait to see him. Well, my pa's over taking care of some business. I'll get your luggage down, and as soon as he gets back, we'll be on our way. Just sit over there and rest yourself. Let me have that bag, Charlie. I signed this contract with you in good faith, Mr. Cartwright. Now, it was my understanding that I'd get my $100,000 today. You're absolutely correct, Mr. Gibbon. I'm trying to explain to you. An unforeseen circumstance has arisen, and I must ask you for a slight extension so that I can raise the money elsewhere. Well, I'm not happy about this at all. Not at all. Time is money. You've already started your lumbering operations on my land, and I'm expected to wait for the money. Oh, Mr. Giblin, I, I'm not asking for, for a year's extension. It's just a couple of days, and I hope that you think that I'm good for it. <laughs> I'm certain of that, Mr. Cartwright. However, I uh, shall expect reasonable recompense for allowing late delivery of the lease money. There'll um, have to be certain alterations in our contract. Uh, what are you suggesting? Well, I've no wish to be hard on you, Mr. Cartwright, but uh, business is business. Shall we say 25% uh, of your gross on the operation? 25%. <laughs> Mr. Gibbon, I thought you used the word reasonable. What you're suggesting is highway robbery. Take it or leave it. Well, if that's the way you're going to put it, Mr. Giblin, I will leave it. And I will leave your land tomorrow. You'll pay damages. Reasonable damages, Mr. Giblin. Reasonable damages. Did you ever fly with Riley in his wondrous gas balloon? But over the lovely city by the pale light of the moon. No, I've never flown with Riley because I can plainly see that living the life of Riley might well be the death of me. <laughs> now try it, will you? All right, everybody. Right, here we go. Ever, ever fly with Riley in his wondrous gas balloon? Up over the lovely city by the pale light of the moon. Of the moon. No, I've never flown with Riley because I can plainly see that living the life of Riley. Living the life of Riley might well be the death of me. <laughs> Thank you, my darling. When I look at you, I feel 30 years younger. Oh, Papa. When I try to get up, I feel 40 years older. Well, old man, let me help you. Oh, ah, there we are. Bring on the red coat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That was fun. But I think I could do with a breath of air. Uh, you know, I was just about to suggest... Shall we go? <laughs> Excuse us. Well, how delightful to be escorted by two gentlemen. <laughs> well, I can see why you're so proud of her. She's beautiful. Just beautiful. There she is. That she is. It's a lovely evening. Yeah. It's more than I deserve. Oh, it was a grand evening. Do you ever fly with Riley in his wondrous gas balloon? Oh, I, went, I meant to ask you. What? How did you get along today with that Mr. Giblin? Oh, Mr. Giblin? Uh, not too well. <laughs> But don't worry, somehow we'll work things out. Tell me the truth. Didn't he give enough time to raise the money? 
Well, yes, as a matter of fact, he did. And all he wanted in return was 25% of the gross. <laughs> Why, that crook. Yes, that's what I thought, too. You're not going to do business with him under those circumstances. I'm not going to do business with him under any conditions. I'm pulling my man of machines off his place down until tomorrow morning. That'll cost you a pretty penny. Well, it'll be cheaper in the long run. Ah, uh, it's all my fault. Oni, let's talk about something pleasant, shall we? How about a brandy? All right. All right. Giblin. Giblin. Oh, I never flown with Riley. Because I can plainly see how living the life of Riley might well be the death of me. Did you ever fly with Riley in his wondrous gas balloon up and over the lovely city? If you plunge your arm into this little black bag, you will find not a snapping frog, but $114,000 in cash. You say you're looking for some profitable business venture in which to invest your money? Yes, I am. You've come to the right place, Mr. Dugan. I thought I had. By the way, will you call me Oni? Now, regarding my investment, Mr. Giblin. Uh, call me Hubert. All right, Hubert. Now, I think that you have a building here in town by the name of the Golden Horseshoe. Yeah, that white elephant. Oh, yes, 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 yes. A sturdy structure. Well, I see you have that rare ability to realize the business potential of the place. I'm glad you see it that way. It makes it easier for me to propose the partnership that I have in mind. Now, you provide the building, and I will use this entire sum to make a grand and elegant place. With the proper financing, it uh, just might be quite a success. With what I have in mind, it'll be packed. It'll take a man of vision like yourself to make a go of a place that size. A man of vision, yes, but better than myself. Someone more experienced. I have a father in New York. He's run a place like twice that big for years now. He'll be taken over. Father, you say? <laughs> well, no offense, but uh, isn't he a trifle old to be working? <laughs> there is no substitute for experience, right? <laughs> Yeah, you make the offer sound most attractive. And we split the profits, 50-50. Right down the line. All right, I'll drop the uh, partnership agreement right away. Just one thing. Now, I may have to loan this money temporarily to a friend of mine before we go into business together. His name is Cartwright. Is that uh, Ben Cartwright? Do you know him? Uh, we've met. Well, then you understand that he keeps things to himself. But I was able to find out that he'd made a bad lumber deal. He has to pay out an unfair portion of his profits. Now, I may have to force this money onto him in order to help him get out of it. It just so happens that uh, I have some uh, influence with the timber interests here. I just might be able to prevail upon them to be a little bit more reasonable, Mr. Cartwright. Well, in that case, I wouldn't have to lend that to him, would I? Then we could proceed with our little business agreement. Exactly. Onward and upward, as they say. <laughs> Only you talk my language. Hubert, I should. I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> well, shall we get to this partnership agreement? Good yeah. idea. I have it right here with me. Sign there. I don't know what kind of a tree you fell out of, but I can guarantee you're a nut. How can I take a job chopping trees if I'm going to spend the next ten years in jail? Well, that's an interesting question. Now I've got one of my own. What have you got against the Cartwrights? Oh, I don't know. It's... It's, well... It isn't easy to say. Well, think deep about it. I still don't know. When I'm sober, I don't seem to mind them too much. Ah, well, why don't you try staying sober for a little bit? Well, I can try. All right, then. I'll withdraw the charges against you. I'll straighten things out with the sheriff and the judge. And I'll arrange some kind of a parole. Well, you hear what I said? I hear you, but I don't believe you. Why would you do this? 
Well, it's not an easy thing to explain. It has something to do with balancing the books. It has something to do with casting the first stone. And something to do with the fact that a man by the name of Patrick O'Neill can't be all bad. I'll drink to that. Honey, it was nice of you to get Patrick O'Neill out of jail. You know, of course you were right. He wasn't, he wasn't intending to kill us. He was drunk. But do you really want me to hire him? Well, you said yourself he was one of the best logger foreman in the business when he was sober. Ah, exactly. When he was sober. And he hasn't been that in a long, long time. He'll change. A man may be down, but he's never out. Well, all right. I'll hire him. But the first time he's in trouble on the job, I'll have to get rid of him. I don't think he will. But you sure are right about people changing. <laughs> you know, yesterday, that fellow given, I wouldn't have given a dead coyote for him. And today, he gives me all the time I need to pay him what I owe, no penalties attached, all free and clear. He's a changed person. He is? Well, I never. Hey, yeah, you see, you give people enough time and they'll mend their evil ways, as my grandmother used to say. <laughs> well, I gotta get me an early start. I'll see you in the morning. Help me, sir. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, we don't have trees this tall in the east, but we've got more squirrels per square foot. <laughs> There's Patrick. Now, if Ireland had this much timber, we'd have overwhelmed the English with our shillings. <laughs> Tony, pour a little jewelry over here. Aye. Who's that, Poppin' Jay? <laughs> he happens to be a very good friend of mine, that's who. Any more questions? Not with the answers you give. Well, then let's get on with the work. Well, you better have the men clear the lower slope first, huh? Yeah, that'll make it easy to skip the logs down from the upper ridge. Yeah. Men! <laughs> well, howdy, how are you? <laughs> yes, your men are as busy as a pocket full of bees. Yeah, they sure are. And that Patrick, how is he working out so far? Oh, he's, he's doing great. Great, he's a good foreman. Because I just can't figure out how he managed to hire every Irishman in town since this morning. <laughs> You can't trust him. He's from the north. Now, you forgive me, I've got a bit of my own business to do in town. Now, I'll see you, though. Right. Hey, what kind of business is only getting? Well, I don't know, but that Barney, he's going to get through it without much of a struggle, I'll guarantee. <laughs> I may. I think, however, that he's going to have a bit of a struggle on his hand, just the same. Right, with what? With himself. With himself. It's a nice day. It was a nice day. The sight of you two would chase a snake up a rope. You don't really mean that. We've been kind of worried about you, Oni. Let's go over to the saloon and have a little drink. Come off of it, Tierney. I'm here as a retired gentleman, rich and respectable. What would I be doing with the likes of you? We're simply fellow New Yorkers you happen to meet. Uh, interested in a little friendly business conversation. Uh, oh, you want to be friendly, don't you? I do not. Well, extend yourself. Oh, yeah. Anything you need, Mr. Dugan, just call on me. Thank you, Bruno. <laughs> and I, I must say, you're a big man in town, only. It's royal treatment every time. That's because I'm not shanty Irish like you. Uh, Bruno can sense the royal blood in my veins. Sure, Roni, sure. It may seem a bit unfriendly, our checking up on you like this, but the organization's a little nervous these days. There's a new atmosphere back home. What with the reformers sticking their sharp blue noses into everything except a man's morning coffee? Tweed himself was worried about the last report. The boys would like to check on the current state of their um, investments, is the word we use. What's that got to do with me? Well, you took a hundred odd thousand dollars out of New York to invest it in some honest enterprise with your friend Mr. Cartwright. That was with the boys' approval. What about it? You didn't invest it with Cartwright. You deposited it in the Virginia City Bank. 
Not only was the money deposited, but you've been withdrawing big chunks of it in bank drafts. Why? Well, uh, I think you two deserve some answers, and I'm going to give them to you. Now, I tell you. You recall that big saloon in the corner, the one with the handsome pillars? You mean the one that's vacant? The same, only it won't be vacant long because I'm taking it over and it'll be the biggest in the West. That's your investment. It is. So you see, I couldn't ask Cartwright to go in with me because he knows nothing about it. So I went big with Giblin. <laughs> and I must say, Ollie, you never did think small. That's what the bank drafts were for. I sent for the equipment, and it took almost all of the $114,000. But it was worth it. I'm starting on the inside first so that we can open sooner. Good thinking. I thought you'd see it my way. I'm sorry if we appear to be a bit rough on you, but, uh, well, that's our job, you understand. And I, uh, I really want to say it, and I mean it from the heart. I'm glad we didn't have to tell Julie about your misguided past. Of course, I understand. And now you can report that only Dugan has made the smartest investment in his life. Schlanter. 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 Good day, gentlemen. The saloon business. The golden horseshoe. Golden horseshoe? Only when I, when I heard that you'd bought that saloon, I could not believe my ears. On your own deathbed, you confessed to me that that money that you had was stolen money. It was tainted money. And the moment you find out that you're not going to die, what do you do? You buy a saloon with it. I didn't buy it. Well, whatever you did with it. You don't understand that. No, I don't understand. Now, will you kindly explain? Well, I can't do it yet. You will have to give me one week. Only I have given... Darling, darling. Ah, you should have been in bed uh, hours ago. We were just talking over a little business, Ben and I. Nothing you'd be interested in. You didn't hear us, did you? Do you think in all these years I didn't know what you were doing? The stolen money, the deals, the payoffs. You must have misunderstood. No, Papa. I know everything. Everything? Yes. Oh, my friend. You may think it's strange, but I wish I had been killed by that bullet. Be less painful than this. If only I had another week. Do you think in one week you could make up what you've done in a lifetime? Oh, no. But as my grandfather used to say, I can try. After all, it only took six days for the Lord to make the whole earth. The owner's missing breakfast together this morning. Yes, fifth day in a row. I heard him leaving when I was getting dressed. Don't can't understand, Mr. Tukin. At first, all time late for breakfast. Now, too early. Huh. Then I go. Looks like he's going to go ahead with the saloon, huh? Sure does. He's very serious about it. Let's eat and get up to the lumber camp. My week is up. I want you to come into town with me. Town for what? My shipment's coming in. Now, this is the last favor I'll ask you. Now, you come on, will you? And will you bring Patrick O'Neill with you? Will you? All right, yeah. all right, I'll do it. We better get Patrick O'Neill. Come on, let's go. Today's the 
big day, eh, partner? That it is, partner. That it is. And here she comes now. I can hardly wait to see our equipment, Oni. Undoubtedly the finest marble top bar, cup crystal chandeliers, plate glass mirrors, piano, and rugs as thick as bearskins. <laughs> I can't imagine an operator like you buying second-rate furnishings. I didn't. Be assured of that. Back to the yard, Hi, with Riley. All right, man. Hello, take the covers off there, will you? That's an altar. It is. What's this all about, Mr. Dugan? Now call me Oni. Well, where's the fixtures? You ordered for the saloon. Saloon? I don't recall guaranteeing that there'd be a saloon. What was all that talk about your father coming from the East to run the place? Well, not my father, a father. Father O'Brien, and a very fine man <laughs> he is, too. Don't you try to cheat me, you crook. I own half of this place. I've got a paper to prove it. But well, it's my investment, too, and I say it'll be a church. It's a long way from being a church, and you know it. As far as I'm concerned, it's a saloon, and it's going to stay that way. And I say that it'll be a church. We'll see about that. All right, see about it. What are you staring at there? Give him a hand, will you? <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> oh, my darling, darling, it's the least I could do. Hey! Go on! Pitch in, will you? You know, this is the church you'll be attending from now on. Unless, of course, you intend to go back to New York and give Boss Tweed a full progress report. Hey, hey. Oh, nice. Ah, uh, there's a bit of equipment that's been long time needed around here. And I hope you'll be spending a good deal of time in it, Papa. I will, I promise. Cartwright! Mr. Cartwright! Giblin's been tearing around town hiring every tough he can find. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all. He's the type who'd steal a dead fly from a blind spider. I guess he tends to make good on his threat. Well, we're not going to have too much longer to find out. Well, I told you I'd be back, Dugan. We'd not have been disappointed in the least if you'd failed to keep a promise, Mr. Gaboon. That's Giblin. I'm a man of action and I'll not be cheated. All right, man, you know what I hired you for. Everything goes back in those wagons. You're a smart man, Mr. Giblin. And you'd be smarter still if you'd buy these poor young men a drink and not let them get their heads broken. Walk right over the top of him if you have to. He's only one uh, man. Mr. Given? Does it make any difference? And besides my friends there, it may interest you to know that it wasn't for nothing that I hired the firm of Duffy and McGee to do me hauling. I'll double your pay. Now get in there and get him. Let's get him! Right, get him. <laughs>
<laughs> now that that's over with, is there any further business matters you'd like to be discussing with me? The church is all yours. <laughs> there we are. I want to thank you, but didn't I tell you he was a tiger in the street? <laughs> You know, how can I ever thank you, gentlemen, for the magnificent help you've given me over the last oh, three weeks? Well, it looks wonderful. There comes my father. Ah. Oh, oh, father O'Brien, welcome to the Wicked West oh, and your new parry. <laughs> ah, you remember my daughter, Julie? Yes, yes. Julie, oh, bless your heart. Hello, oh. Father. Now, these are my good friends, the Cartwrights. How do you do, gentlemen? Father, how are you? Oh. I, I've got to be admitting it, Tony. It's every bit like you said it was in your letter. Indeed it is. Now, about the church. We haven't even started on the outside yet, you know. It looks like the devil. But the inside, it looks like heaven itself. Sure, anyone can tell at a glance. It's a fine, upstanding... Peace, love and tell. <laughs> which nobody can deny, my friend. Which nobody can deny. Uh -huh. <laughs> Come along, father. Oh, in <laughs> Which nobody can deny. <laughs> <laughs> We might have a few words together. I certainly, Mr. Endicott. I see no reason why we shouldn't. Oh, Mrs. Wright suggests that we use her study. I wanted to meet you for a long time. A happy circumstance that we were both invited to be Mrs. Wright's guests in her home when you and your sons were in San Francisco. I have the distinct feeling that you might have arranged for those invitations. <laughs> yes, well, to business. You are aware that I own certain parcels of land in Nevada. Mr. Endicott, I'm aware that you own half of the northern part of the state of Nevada. I like Nevada, Mr. Cartwright. It's young, vital, growing. I want to help with that growth, which means taking an active part in the politics of the state. I want to ask your full and active support for an old friend of yours. For what office? Governor. And your candidate? John Faraday, your friend. Miss Grandicott, our present governor has served this state capably and honestly, and he wishes to remain in office, and he has my full support. Faraday is counting on you. I've known John for a long time, and I admired him until he became your tame judge. My Tame judge. Didn't you pay for all his campaign expenses when he ran for office in Virginia City two years ago? John Faraday has been a good judge, and you cannot say otherwise. Yes, it's true. But so far, he hasn't had to rule on the legality of any of your land transactions. That's when he begins to earn his keep, isn't that so? Be careful how you slander me, Cartwright. Well, I don't consider it slander to say that a a man like you wants a governor who will come running whenever you whistle and do exactly what you tell him to. Mr. Endicott, you have a reputation for corrupting everything you touch. 
Now you want to control a governor so you can corrupt this state. You're not going to do either. I promise you that. Is this a declaration of war, Cartwright? Unless you stay out of Nevada politics. Fighting me can be a very unhealthy pursuit. A number of men could confirm that, except that they are no longer with us. Are you threatening me? Make of it what you will. But don't get in my way. I talked with Mr. Endicott. I uh, thought you might have something to tell me. No, John, I, uh, I haven't had anything to tell you. Mr. Endicott possibly has. Judge Faraday. Yes. Mr. Endicott would like to talk to you. Right away. I'll uh, see you back in Virginia City. Good night, gentlemen. Judge. Paul, what was that all about, anyhow? Sam Endicott is increasing his investments in Nevada. Mm, property or people? Both, Joseph. Both. I thought you said Ben Cartwright was a friend of yours. Well, he is a friend of mine. I thought he was. He will not support you. Did he say why? Ben Cartwright has ambitions of his own. He wants to sit in the governor's chair. But he's never held an elective or a point of office. He wants to be governor. He asked for my support. I turned him down. He's too arrogant, too self-seeking, not the right man at all. I've never thought of him in that way, but yes, sir. With Cartwright against you, it'll be a tougher race, but uh, you'll win. On your way out, ask Mr. Broom to come in. Of course. Thank you, Mr. Endicott. If I do win, I'll do everything in my power to be the kind of governor... Never mind. Save the speeches for the campaign. <laughs> Mr. Endicott wants to see you. We've got a fight on our hands. Cartwright is tougher and better informed than I thought he could be. It's an error in judgment, Broom. And Faraday, is he still in the bag? He'll do as he's told as long as he can convince himself that it is for the common good. But that's only half of our problem. Cartwright is going to search for ammunition with which to fight us. If he digs deeply enough, he might discover our plans for the development company. If he does, we'll buy him off. Not a chance. Ben Cartwright is a highly moral man. Well, that kind comes a little more expensive. We'll make him a partner. He wouldn't listen to that for one minute. There's only one answer. Not so fast. The nominating committee meets in Carson City in 20 days. Without Cartwright's support, Faraday couldn't be nominated for dog catcher. If Cartwright endorses Faraday... No contest. Faraday wins going away. But Ben Cartwright isn't going to change his mind. 
So we can't win without Cartwright's endorsement. That means we will get Cartwright's endorsement one way or the other, dead or alive. As I said, there's only one answer. You will leave in the morning for Carson City. The hotel? Cattleman's Hotel. You rent the biggest suite. Hire whomever you need. You start this campaign with the biggest fan for odd possible. Done it many times before. Do you, uh, have a man to take care of, uh... I'll get one. Much obliged, old timer. Anytime you're in the market for Hastings hardware, best in the West by test, you remember old Welburn White. Drummer par excellence. I can read your unspoken thoughts, Mr. Broom. You're thinking that I don't look like somebody you'd hire to kill a man. You don't look like a man I'd hire to hold a horse. <laughs> One of my greatest assets, sir. You just think about it for a minute and you'll see that I'm right. You know something? I never go anywhere without these catalogs. They're my passport. Take me anywhere I want to go, no questions asked. See, I sell hardware. That's my cover. The hardware I sell is very real. I'll sell you one two-penny nail, 40 horse collars, or 100 gross of axes. Now, I carry another little book. But I only show the special people, like yourself. Go ahead, open it up. Prominent Denver attorney found dead. No clues. And turn the page. Oh, now that's a good one. Wyoming mourns unsolved murder of state's attorney. <laughs> and you know something? He never went anywhere without a bodyguard. Here's your advance. That's $500. Well, now, that's right as rain. Plus another $2,000 payment upon delivery, as you might call it. Time is of the essence. You mean hit quick and get out of the state fast? Quick, but not slipshod. The, um... customer is Ben Cartwright of the Ponderosa. Now, you pick him big, mister. Not too big for you, Mr. White? No, sir. They all fall down when they're hit by a 44. Ben Cartwright. I have to have a whole new chapter just for him in my little book. I'll leave on the first stage for Virginia City. Oh, come on, relax, Mr. Broom. I guarantee satisfaction. <laughs> As of right now, Mr. Ben Cartwright is as good as dead. doesn't reconvene for another 10 minutes. Part of a judge's obligation to be available to the public. Thank you. Sit down. John, I, uh, I'd like to discuss your candidacy. Yes, I thought that would be the subject of your visit. Well, I... Ben, 
Would it help if I assured you that I did or said nothing to influence Mr. Endicott's choice of a candidate? I didn't come here to pass judgment on you. Well, then sir. why did you come, Ben? Certainly not to offer me your congratulations or your backing. Uh, no, wait. I don't blame you. If I were in your shoes, I'd probably feel the same way. You must have had your heart set on that nomination. And then to be turned down by the man who could help you most, well... Believe me, I can understand your disappointment. Wait a minute, Judge. I don't resent your candidacy. It's your backing that concerns me. And I think it should concern you too, John. And let's get a couple of things straight. I never sought the nomination. But if I did, Endicott would be the last man in the world I'd ever turn to for help. Well, if that's your story, Ben, I won't argue. If you want to say face, that's your business. Only don't expect me to go along with it. All right, John. That's what you want to believe. Let's talk about the governorship. And you, and Endicott. Why is he backing you? Because he's my friend. And he knows I'll do everything I can to be a good governor. John, I'm going to lay it right on the line. What's in it for him? Oh, I see through you now, Ben Cartwright. You'd like to get at Endicott through me. Well, it won't work. Endicott is an honest man. Who just happens to want to pay all your campaign expenses. Now, if you have a quarrel with Endicott, that's personal. I have nothing to do with that. But don't impugn his honesty or mine. Court convenes in two minutes. Was there anything else on your mind, Mr. Cartwright? No, I guess not. The worst part of all this is... you believe everything you said. people to listen to us. The problem is, what do we tell them? They tell them the truth. Endicott's trying to steal the state of Nevada. What do we say when they ask for proof? Why don't you just tell them what you think, Paul? I mean, people around here have been taking your word for things for a long time. You're a delegate to the convention. You get a chance to talk then. Oh, yes, I plan to do that. But as you said, Endicott's a smart man, and he'll be ready and waiting. He'll tell the convention just what he told Judge Faraday that I'd try to get him to back me, and uh, he turned me down. And then what? You just uh, sense the nomination of Judge Faraday, don't you? Two weeks before the convention starts, huh? Well, I'll try to talk to as many delegates as I can. Hope that I can convince them. I'm late for calling, huh? Mr. Cartwright? Well, yeah, I'm one of them. What can I do for you? Well, my card, sir. Wilburn White, Hastings Hardware. Satisfaction guaranteed. It's a hardware salesman, pal. We'll have the gentleman come in. Right this way, sir. Much obliged. Ah, you must be Mr. Ben Cartwright. That's right, I am. Wilburn White, at your service, sir. Uh, you're a hardware salesman? Yes, Hastings. The best in the West by test. Well, I hope you didn't come out from town just to see us. Well, you're the last of four ranches in this area. As if you had, you've uh, made a trip for nothing. You see, we've been buying our hardware from a dealer in Virginia City for some years now, and, well, actually, there's no reason to change. Oh, well, that's the fortunes of war, as you might say. Hey, you stick around for a cup of coffee? Oh, much obliged, but I think I'll get back into town. You know, a city man like me gets mighty nervous at night out here in the wide open spaces. <laughs> Well, it was good meeting all of you. You know, it's not very often you get a chance to meet somebody as important as Ben Cartwright. No, sir, Ree. Uh, good, night, good night, sir. Good night there, young fella. Cheerful, cuz, ain't he? Why shouldn't he be? 
Well, you got nothing on his mind but hardware. Hmm. Yes, that's all I had on my mind. Well, I'd better get some rest. I've got a, a lot of talking to do in the next couple of weeks. Good night, Paul. Good night. Some men who might want to see me dead. There's only one I can think of right now. Handicott. But that... That night in San Francisco, Mrs. Wrights, he threatened me with murder. I thought I was bluffing. Well, from what I hear about Endicott, he's capable of anything. What about bushwhacking when you risk a hanging? All kinds of men you can hire to do some bushwhacking for you. Well, so how do we prove it? Don't get in my way. Those are the last words he said to me. Don't get in my way. And I got in his way. I got in the way... the thing he wanted most. Friday's nomination. And we can't let him get away with it. Yes, we can, Joe. We can and we will. Oh, it's that, uh, that bushwhacker. He wouldn't have any way of knowing whether I was dead or not, would he? Oh, no, I don't reckon there's any way he could. Yeah. All right, then. One of you will go into Virginia City. Announce my death. What are you talking about, your death? What for? Now, that Dr. Wilson. He's a, he's a man that'll help us in our kind of fight, I think. Talk to him first. We're going to fix Endicott once and for all. <laughs> get used to reading my own obituaries. Well, all this fills me with a great deal of respect. I had no idea I was such a wonderful person. Paul, you don't suppose them fellas might be stretching a little? <laughs> I'm sure they were, but I sure hate to play this kind of cruel trick on some very fine people. Well, as soon as they find out why you're doing it, they'll forgive you. I hope so. Me. Hey. I just can't even know a batch of mail. How is he? Oh, he's fine. He ate a bigger lunch than Hoss. He does more complaining than any corpse I've ever been around. I wish you fellas would stop talking about me as if I weren't here. Sorry about that. There's a lot of excitement in town. They found the bushwhacker. They did? Coffee thinks so. It's a man named Briggs. Briggs? I don't know anyone named Briggs. Well, that figures. A hired gun and a cop brought in to kill you. Well, he may be a hired gun, but he looks more like a saddle tramp. 
His uh, horse had a nick in one of his shoes. Sheriff Coffey found hoof prints to match it near the barn. And there was a rifle cartridge there, too. Has he confessed? Not yet, but he had $200 in his pocket. He admits not having worked for three months, but he uh, claims he won in a poker game. Well, it should be easy enough to prove if it's true. No, not so easy. It was a two-handed poker game in a hotel room. No witnesses, and the loser left town. Convenient. Sheriff Covey's convinced he has the right man, so is the uh, prosecutor. Trial starts tomorrow. Tomorrow? Sort of pushing things, ain't they? Well, Mr. Cartwright was a very important man. Town's in an ugly mood. They've got a rope and a gallows, and they're looking for somebody to hang. That sure changes things. Well, that convention starts in five days anyhow. There ain't no way they can finish that trial up by then. I wouldn't count on that. female delegates. Some of the delegates have wives and sisters. Some of the men have lady friends. That happened to be one of mine. What else have you accomplished? I spent a lot of your money. Where I had to, I promised state house help. And where I could, I, uh, I bought the votes. We have votes enough? Almost. And the uh, Cartwright? $2,500. I uh, also had to buy you a forger. That was another 750 I didn't know that they were that expensive. I always find it wiser to pay what they ask. Otherwise, they might sign your name to a check. Aren't you going to invite me in, mister? What are you doing here? According to our agreement, you were supposed to get out of the state and stay out. Mm. That was until I found out who I was working for. You're working for me. Not unless your name is Samuel Carter Endicott. It's all right, Broom. Perhaps this gentleman would like to discuss matters further with me. Well, if you're Samuel Carter Endicott. I am. I'll handle this room. You took a chance coming here. No moon tonight. I left my horse three streets down, came up the back stairway. Nobody saw me. Most commendable, Mr... Uh... White. Welburn White. I take it that we are indebted to you for all the evidence leading to the arrest of the cowhand Briggs. Oh, well, you take it right, mister. I stole this horse from the livery stable and used it right out to the Ponderosa. And you know something? I played two-handed poker with him in my hotel room, and I lost $200 to him. A stroke of genius. And now you feel that you are entitled to more than the stipulated sum. I agree, Mr. White. Uh, Mr. Broom is inclined to watch the purse strings over carefully. 
How much more would you think is fair? One thousand? Two? Well, now, the way I look at it, mister, this ought to be worth, oh, let's say 10,000 a year minimum. A year, did you say? Are you saying that you expect an annual honorarium? Well, a man as important as you. I have a lot of people on your payroll. But I don't imagine you got anybody with my, uh, <laughs> particular talent. <laughs> Touche, Mr. White. I admire your business acumen. You, uh, obviously have, uh, I've studied the pros and cons, weighed them carefully, and you have decided that I cannot afford to turn you down. Well, that's about the size of it, yes. So you have rightly come here, without anyone seeing you, to make sure that I make sure that you don't talk. And it would be churlish of me to disappoint you. find his horse and get rid of it. As to our friend there, he will fit very nicely into the steamer trunk which you will ship to San Francisco and load aboard one of our vessels bound for the Orient. Fortunately, that poor devil Briggs will pay for Mr. White's crime. I've never seen a man convicted so quick on circumstantial evidence before. Uh, this town's in an ugly mood. You saw they were looking at the jury. If they'd have found him innocent, they probably would have tarred and feathered him. Or worse. I just can't imagine them hanging him so quick. Tomorrow, I've never seen it set so fast. Well, I'm no authority on hangings, but uh, I don't know what else Judge Faraday could have done. If he'd have kept that man in jail any longer, they'd have burned down the jail and him in it. And the convention starts tomorrow. Well, I'm gonna get back to the ranch and give Pa the news. Right. I'll see you later. I sure didn't think they'd rush through that trial so quickly. All we needed was one more day. One day. And what do we do now? Governor. He can stop the hanging. Yeah. Yes, he would. I'd have to show myself to him. And Endicott would now. One whole day before I want him to. The only thing I've got going for me is the surprise of showing up at the right time. Convention opens tomorrow morning. What time? Ten o'clock. What time's the hanging scheduled for? Ten in the morning. Well, we'll ride into town tonight after dark and get Judge Faraday to issue a stay of execution. He's in the cut, man. What other choice do we have? I thought you were a ghost when you walked in. I thank God you're alive. So do I. But the rest. Ben, your accusations are wild. Totally without foundation. Well, I'll say it again. Sam Endicott hired an assassin to kill me. All right. I believe there was an assassin. But I don't believe Sam Endicott hired him. 
Well, who else would want to see my pa dead? I think your father will admit he might have other enemies than Endicott. But who else would want me dead now, at this particular time, just before the convention? It's conjecture, supposition. Ben, can you prove any of these things in court? Not at this time. Well, then your accusations are pure slander. Mr. Endicott can sue you for everything you own and win. I know that. But given time, I think I can force Mr. Endicott to expose himself. I'll never believe Endicott had anything to do with it. Well, if Pa didn't believe it, why do you suppose he pretended to be dead? To get even with Endicott. For what? For backing me as a candidate in place of him. Uh, I told you before, I'm not a candidate now, and I never have been. Endicott said you came and asked him for his support. You've known my father a long time, Judge Faraday. Have you ever known him to lie? All right, Endicott exaggerated. John. We've been friends. Haven't you wondered why I refused to back you? You made it quite clear you thought I'd be bad for the state. No. No, not you. Endicott. If you're elected, you'll be in his debt. And then one day he'll ask you for a small favor for one of his friends. Oh, nothing important, just a matter of executive prerogative. The next favor will be for him. Only it'll be bigger, and the one after that'll be bigger again, and then you won't be able to stop him or stop yourself. Get out! Get out and leave me alone. Are you going to force me to show my hand now? John, do you really think that I would use my own attempted murder in self-interest? Do you really believe that I could play this kind of trick on all my friends? If I'm wrong, if Sam Endicott is innocent, by tomorrow night I'll be the laughing stock of Nevada and you'll be governor. But suppose I'm right. Just suppose I'm right. I came here tonight to show myself to you, to save Briggs from hanging. But if Endicott finds out about this, he'll announce to the world that I'm alive and guilty of the worst, the dirtiest political hoax ever pulled in this state. If you issue that stay of execution now, without giving any reasons, you will give me time to prove to you, to everybody, that Endicott is everything I've said he is. If I'm wrong, you win. If I'm right, you lose. But you'll have done the state a great service. This is the biggest decision of your life, John. from Tonopah. I used to work for him. According to him, Joe, it's all but over. The um, floor vote's going to be only a formality. Faraday. That's what the man says. That's what I heard. Well, maybe there's something you haven't heard your name bearing a cart, right? Endicott and Broom are talking to key delegates in the hotel, helping to make up their minds. Yeah, I heard that too. How are you? How's the wife and the new dog? Jim? Oh, yes. Is there Endicott like to talk to you now? Fine. Do you think so?
Jim Porter owns the Bar M Ranch. Wife named Mary, daughter Penelope. Oh, Mr. Porter. Jim, how's the wife? No, don't, don't tell me. I'll remember. Mary. Oh, it beats me how you do it. We only had an opportunity to say howdy, and that was six, seven months ago. Well, a man likes to remember his friends. Only yesterday, I was talking about you to our next governor, John Faraday. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, he likes you very much. Now, what's your pleasure? Oh, whatever you have, just a short one. I'm complimented you picked me. I had to pick someone I could trust, Senator. I only wish I could be of more help. I believe everything you tell me, but not all the delegates know you as well as I do. And I can't prove a word of it. You know the man who controls the key delegates is going to win this battle. Gentlemen, delegates. Your friend and mine, the Honorable Samuel Endicott, would like to say a few words. Thank you, gentlemen. In a few minutes, the convention will convene. And the serious business of nominating our next governor will begin. Before that happens, I want to read to you a very important letter from a very important man. The late Ben Cartwright was my friend. Senator, I think it's about time you got down there. Thanks. Be right, Tom. Well? Good luck. I now speak for Ben Cartwright. I read to you from a letter that he wrote me the day before an assassin's bullet ended his life. I can think of no man better fitted to govern Nevada than our mutual friend, Judge John Faraday. Gentlemen, Ben Cartwright never wrote any such letter. Very much alive, Mr. Endicott. I have never written a letter to Sam Endicott. I never put any recommendations on paper. I'm afraid Mr. Endicott has lied to you. He is not my friend. He is not your friend. He is certainly not the friend of the state of Nevada. I told him I would not support Judge Faraday. And when I further told him that I would support none of his nominations, he hired that assassin to kill me. I'd like to see that letter. Of course. This isn't even a good forgery. This is not my signature. Now, gentlemen, Ben Cartwright could or could not have hired the unfortunate man who was hanged at Virginia City this morning to play the role of assassin. But the blame for that poor wretch's death must be forever on the conscience of Ben Cartwright. A human sacrifice for political gain. Gentlemen, there was no hanging in Virginia City this morning. That man in jail is alive. And the stay of execution was ordered by Judge Faraday himself. And now, gentlemen, 
the moment of decision. On the one hand, a governor who has served us honorably and well, and who deserves our continued support. On the other hand, a puppet controlled by Mr. Endicott and Mr. Broom, two scoundrels who have corrupted everything they've ever touched. And it will stop at nothing, not even murder, to get what they want. The future course of our state, the future course of the state of Nevada will be decided today in this room. Now, gentlemen, you can let Endicott and Broom loot and destroy our state. Or you can stop them in their tracks. Your vote is the only weapon you need. Hold up, Ben. I'll be proud to walk on that convention floor with you. Come on. Well, Ben, how does it feel to win on the first ballot? I'm glad the governor was renominated. Faraday sending that telegram withdrawing his name from the convention sure helped a lot. How do I feel? I'm glad it's all over. Faraday had a lot more integrity than I gave him credit for. Shame it took a man like Endicott to bring it out. Well, uh, friend Endicott's finally given up the ghost. I expected anything like this when I rode in the river down this morning. You're not trying to tell me that you gotta go, are you? Afraid so. Mr. Cartwright wants us back to the herd come dark. That's two whole hours away. Seventeen, black and no one. Hot! Ah! Go! We lost again. That's the hungriest roulette wheel I ever saw. <laughs> I drove first. Come on, Loopy. We need a drink. Back down, Tony. Two bears, buddy. All right, shawty. <laughs> Gonna have to be a roundup in here before we go anyplace. How about it, Loopy? Well, one roll. Low man buys the drinks. Go ahead. I gotta get lucky sometime, shorty. <laughs> Seems more like a lifetime since we left Clearwater. It all came back today, didn't it? The barn dances, the band concerts.
Hey, why the tears? It's awful nice to, to say hello to an old friend. Not so nice to say goodbye. You still can't lie with a hoot. Come on, what's the matter? Candy, do me a favor. Sure. Just ride on out of here. Do you hear me? No, not till you tell me. Six hundred head. All right, boys, let's find our horses and get back to the camp. Come on, let's move. I thought these fellas might put some fresh money in the sheriff's till. Now I'm sure of it. Come on, fellas, come on, come on. Where's Candy? He's inside talking to a girl. He'll be out in a minute. Mister, we run an open town here, but we don't like trail hands coming in and trying to take it apart. Well, I'm sorry about that. You're right, Sheriff. Of course, I'm taking them right back to camp. Well, those are you men. Yeah? Then you're the one who pays the bill. Now, there's no charge for scaring the citizens because they're getting used to it by now. But that lamp and that water trough your man shot up will have to be paid for. Sheriff, you're right. How much? I figure about $30. <laughs> $30? That lamp chimney should be worth about 25 cents. As far as that trough is concerned, it wouldn't plug in a hammer picks up that leak. $30 or somebody goes to jail. Then with bail and cost, board and all that, it'll pile up fast. Come back any time. I'm afraid your prices are a little high. Then you better be sure you take all your men with you. Because any I find sleeping or drunk are going to jail. Shed a few happy tears. Get out. Candy, come on. We're moving on. I'm staying here, Joe. No, Candy, please. If you want to do me a favor, ask your pa to give me my pay. And here he comes. You ask him yourself. Let's, uh, let's move up. We got hired to move up the trail. If you two can carry yourself. Mr. Carrain, I'm staying here. <laughs> Candy, we got a sheriff who'd like us to move out. I met an old friend. Lila Holden. She needs some help. No. He's mistaken, Mr. Cartwright. I don't need any help from anyone. It's not that I'm leaving you shorthanded. You got more drovers than you need. That's not the point, Ken. I'm trying to tell you something. The sheriff would like us all to move out. Agreement when I hired on, Mr. Cartwright. But I can quit any time. You can send me down the road any time, right? True enough, but you just heard the young lady say she didn't need any help. Mr. Cartwright, please, my pay. You pay here right now. That's right. You didn't tell us you had any friends here in town. I didn't know it till I rode in. You sure? Sure. Thank you. Good luck. And, uh, I'll get 
getting any trouble. It's a rough town. Told him? Take it easy. girl he hasn't seen in a long time. Strange town. I think Candy's asking for trouble. You mean he ain't going with us? Well, I'll tell you about it later. Of course, I must say, if she looked at me like she was looking at him, I think it'd take about 40 horses to pull me out of here. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's get back. Now, how are we going to do that? What you better? Uh, red. Me too. Well, now we'll bet on the black. Let's go get it. All right, at least tell me this much. Do you want to stay in Riverbend or do you want to leave? Candy, I want to leave this town more than anything in the whole wide world. Then why don't you? Stages come and go every day. Right. House wins again. Oh, money. It must be money. How much do you need? It would take at least $50. $30. $32. Oh, I'm 18 short. No, Candy, I don't want to take your money. Look, just forget it. If you left right now, you could catch up with Mr. Cartwright, and I'm sure he'd give you your job back. There's a money stretcher over there. Now, you wait for me right here, and I'm going to make 50, 60 out of this, and we'll hurry. No, Candy, whatever you do, don't. Twenty-seven red, even. No winners. Hey, Candy. Hey, Candy. Oh, hey, buddy. How's the luck? How's the luck? How's the good? Place your best, gentlemen. Black. 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 Come on. Come on. Well, red and even. No winners. House wins again. Listen. Let's let's switch back to red. No. Black. Candy's betting black. Hello. All right. All bets down? Wheels rigged. Wait a minute, buddy. All right, boys, let's get our money back. Today, talking to this one. Who is he? Oh, Candy, just another drover. Not another one of your friends. You're not trying that again. Oh, no, Claude, of course not. Well, get out of sight and stay out until I tell you different. All right, on your feet. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Come on, you two.
kind of got a little delayed, Mr. Cartwright. 600 head of cattle to move and you get delayed. Yes, sir. We was coming right back, but Loopy sort of got pinned down. Well, not exactly pinned down. Uh, I mean, knocked down. It was purely terrible, Mr. Cartwright. It was a crooked wheel. And Candy got annoyed. I never, never seen the likes of it, Mr. Cartwright. Candy and me and Loopy snatching at the money they stole with, with that crooked wheel. And the sheriff pounding Candy. <laughs> and Candy <laughs> hammering him to a pulp. And then knocking him around that saloon, just hammering him and hammering him. <laughs> what happened, Candy? The deputy knocked him over the head with his gun butt. With his gun butt? How you like that? After all that pretty fighting. You had a bit of trouble here. You might say that. Yeah, that's quite a herd of beef you're moving. Horn tells me about 600 head. You uh, keep a pretty close check, Mr. Booker, Claude Booker. And we like to know where we stand. We don't set the tariff on problems like these unless we know a man can pay for them. You've got two of my men in jail here. What's the bail? Well, the bail's set at $100. Damage to town property is 200 more. It's a bit steep, isn't it? If you think so, go take a look at that saloon they wrecked. Right, now, this only pays for the one called Loopy. There's, there's no bail set on the other one. What do you mean, Candy? That's quite a name he has. Maybe he won't be so sweet time we get through with him. Get back to the herd. Mr. Cartwright, get back to the herd. All right. Now, since when do you keep a man in jail without bail for breaking up a saloon? Whenever I feel like it. The law says I don't have to let anybody out on bail unless I figure they'll be here for the trial. That one doesn't look too dependable to me. He's a type that'd skip town and I'd have to go after him. Now, he's better off where he is. Until the trial judge gets here. All right. When'll that be? Mm, two or three days. What are the charges? Charges? Mr. I got a list of them. Destruction of property, assault with intent to kill, interfering with an officer in the performance of his duty, resisting arrest. That's only the beginning. And each and every one of these charges can cost him $500 and six months in jail. Your boy's gonna be a lot older and a lot poorer before he's out there busting up another saloon. How can we see him? Help yourself. How you feeling? Pretty good. How's the other fella? That's where we got a little problem. Yeah, I know. I heard him. We're trying to get you out of here, Candy, but it's going to take a little longer than we figured. Who wants out? All the comforts are home. Of course, I'm going to miss old Loopy. Candy, you're going to need a good lawyer. Well, that's uh, very kind of you, Mr. Cartwright. But uh, I don't need a lawyer. I can get out of here all by myself. Don't be ridiculous with a sheriff like that out there. Let's get one thing straight, Mr. Cartwright. You don't owe me any favors. I'm not asking any. I'm not giving any favors. I'm offering That's the way I want it. All right. I'm going to 
stand here arguing all day. Come on, we've got a herd to move. But Pa's offering you a lawyer. Now be smart, take him. Joe, thanks. But I don't need it. All right, sit yourself. Take it easy, buddy. See you later, Hoss. In case he wants to buy some stamps, just send a telegram. You take good care of your friends. We'll try to do the same. Unless he gets in his head to break jail. We got a way of handling that, too. A long pine box and a short reading of the scriptures. That's two dollars for holding the horse overnight, including feeding and uh, use of straw. Two dollars? Yeah. Well, uh, what if... Well, I ain't got it. I... I... Back in the jail. Jail? I just came... Mr. Cartwright! You hear what he said he wants? He wants two dollars just for holding my animal overnight. If you've got any objections, take it up with Sheriff Booker. The regulations is posted in his office. Prisoners are responsible for all costs in holding their property while spending time in jail. Two dollars. Here you are. Okay, get your own horse. I'm going to get myself a beer. Loopy. Get your own horse. Thanks, Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright. You just bailed one of your drovers out of jail just now. Why not Candy? Well, we tried, but Sheriff Booker said no. Then you just tell him to stay right where he is. No matter what happens, he mustn't try to leave. No, don't come any closer. What do you mean, exactly? Just, just what I said. Ma'am, Candy's locked up over there behind bars. He ain't likely to go no place. Well, now, you just do what I tell you, you hear? Other men have been locked up safe in that jail and have got killed. I know. I know. Luby, you get back to camp. Joe, you go with him. Luby, you get started. I'll catch up to you. I got my horse down the city. All right. Dollars. You and I better find this Miss Holden, find out what this is all about. Yeah. Don't you think we'll split up? Yeah. You go back to the alley. Look out here. Yes, sir. We will, Miss Holden, but first we got to know a little more about those men who were killed in that jail. But I told you, all I know. Not quite, ma'am. You hadn't told us who they were. Or why they were killed, or how. But I've nothing more to say. I've nothing to say to you, nothing whatsoever. Claude, keep them away from me. Please, Claude. What are you bothering the girl about? Well, uh, Candy stayed behind in town to be with Miss Holden. We were just trying to find out how Candy was acting when he was in the saloon. You run along, Lila. How much trouble are you looking for, mister? Oh, it's Joe's. Hey! What do you want? What are you doing with my son's horse? Darn it. Two dollars a day. Feed and straw. Read the regulation. I asked you a question. Sheriff? Get your hands off him. What are you holding that horse for, Clemmy? A well, horn told me to. He just put the owner in jail for breaking up the mirror at the Sapphire Saloon. Come on. Come on. 
on, boy. Come on. One thing about this hotel, the guests are in no shape to pick a room when they check in. How long have I been here? 10, 15 minutes. After what happened to me, I thought you'd have enough sense to stay out of here. Yeah, staying out was easy. I was getting into it with a problem. I can understand breaking out of jail. Why would you want to break in? I keep you alive. That whack on the head must have shook you up more than I thought. It's not funny, I'm serious. You know, that uh, girl you were talking to in the salon? Isla Holden, what about her? She told me to tell you to stay put. Some other men tried to break out of here and they were killed. She was afraid the same thing might happen to you. Four hundred dollars. The four hundred is just for the damages. That boy you was running up quite a bill. Bar mirror that came all the way from San Francisco. Two tables, three chairs, seven bottles of whiskey. Now, look, you can call it damages. I call it robbery. Your privilege, as long as you pay. And suppose I refuse to pay. I'll impound a hundred head of your beef. Four hundred. Now, about the bail. Never mind about the bail. I want to talk to my son before we discuss bail. Show Mr. Cartwright the prisoner. Well, why? Well, guess you're a little surprised to find me in here, huh? Nope. I'm not surprised at anything you do anymore, Joseph. Kind of mad at me. Nope. No, I'm not mad at you. If you want to spend your time in jail here rather than help take the herd up the trail, that's your business. Oh, look, I never said... I'm not going to bail you out. <laughs> Got your comeuppance, didn't you, boy? <laughs> Get back to camp and get the herd started. Yes, sir. Paul, do you think that sheriff really thinks you're angry with Joe? We'll have to wait and see. Who have you talked to so far? Well, uh, Corker Samuels and Bud Purdy. They're a good man. Yes, siree. Corker's been mayor of River Bend going on ten years, and there ain't a better feed and grain store anywhere than Bud Purdy's. Yeah. What'd they say about Booker? Oh, various things. What do you think about the man? Oh, why ask me? I, I'm just a barber. <laughs> well, from my experience, a barber shop is where most of the influential people in the community congregate. Oh, now that part's right. And barber uh, seems to know more about the community than even the mayor. Well, I do know a little bit about what goes on in Riverbend. <laughs> but you know a whole lot of what goes on. <laughs> I've shaved him since he got the star. That's, uh, let's see, eight, uh, nine years come April. He does his job. Nobody's going to argue about that. He's never been caught stealing or drinking to excess. He likes the ladies, but that's not against the rules since he ain't married. He's had to kill four men, line of duty. Four men, huh? Gunfighters? Two of them were. The others... Sure nice talking to you, Mr. Cartwright, and hearing about the ranch. Well... You come back soon. I sure will. There you are. Thank you, Mr. Cartwright. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Hello, Sheriff. What do you have? A uh, shave. Some talker, that one. He was here for an hour, and I couldn't get a word in. Not one. Not bad. Beef stew, fresh bread, and hot coffee. You're getting the same food I get. You got my sympathy. Yeah, mine too. That stew even smells tough. Keep on. I'll make it bread and water and forget the bread. Hey, 
saw it. You forgot to turn the key. The door's unlocked. Oh, no, he didn't forget. He wants you to see it. I try to go and he kills me. Mm-hmm. You keep saying that. The man wears a star. He's been sheriff around here a long time. Why does he want to commit murder? Well, look, why don't we stop talking about it and I'll prove it. With who, me or you? With me. Proved it. Now he's going to have to kill you, too. You're asking my opinion as an attorney? I'm also willing to pay for it. Well, that immediately sets you apart from the other citizens of Riverbend. Just, uh, what do you want to know about Sheriff Booker? Everything. <laughs> it's an order I can't begin to fill. Before Booker, Riverbend was a town torn to pieces every time a herd came up the trail. Riots, fistfights, shootings. Booker said he'd stop all that. Also, that he'd work without salary. He uh, kept the fines. In lieu of wages. Mm. License to steal. That's been said, yes. But it is legal. Suppose there's no fighting. Well, that hasn't happened yet. There seems to be no end to uh, provocation. Female provocation? So he put the drovers in jail, threw a heavy fine at them. The trail bosses had to bail them out or else they couldn't get their herds to the railhead. Man's a thief. He stays within the law. I understand that he shot and killed two unarmed men in jail. Prisoners who were trying to escape. Sheriff Booker had to shoot in self-defense. There were no witnesses. As a matter of record, no. Why don't you get rid of them? A lot of us would like to do that. But we keep telling ourselves that he does maintain law and order and that our streets are safe for our women folks at no cost to us. The truth is, Sheriff Claude Booker is a cold-blooded killer. We're afraid of him, Mr. Cartwright. And if you're wise, you will be too. Holden. Never heard of her. Lila Holden, she works in the saloon. Wrong saloon. Probably wrong town. Be 
pretty smart. Right out. Do your asking someplace else. Howdy, Tom. Hi. Lila Holden, Empire Hotel, room 17. I'll uh, take that 10 you offered the bartender. Barbering business ain't been too good lately. I, I also do undertaking. Wouldn't surprise me if I had some to do any time now. All you did was have a drink with him. And he quit his job to help you. But I didn't need any help. I told him that. I told you that. Now look, Miss Holden, you came to that livery stable. You begged us to tell Candy not to try to escape from Booker's jail. Why? Did I say that? Yes, you did. Now, why? Was it because two other men have been killed trying to get out of that jail? You were afraid that Candy would be killed, too? Is that it? Is that it? Yes. Yes, I was. Now, Miss Holden, Miss Holden, please. Why were those two men killed? Why? Because both of them were trying to help me escape from Riverbend. From Book. And Candy was going to help you too, huh? Miss mm -hmm. Holden, is there any any tie between you and? Uh, Book, I mean, legally, or... Oh, no. Except a year ago when I came here broken and hungry. He was good to me, that's all. But now, he thinks that he owns me. Twice I got on the stage and he came on and dragged me back. And yet you work with him. You entice people in so you can throw them into jail and find them. But because I have to. You have to? I, I thought it was sort of a joke at first. A very but... funny joke. But as soon as I found out what he was up to, I tried to stop. I... Did you? But he wouldn't let me. He wouldn't let you. I think you'd better go. I'll help you get away from this town if you want to. Oh, I want to more than anything in the whole wide world. But you can't help me, because Booker will find out about it, and he'll find some excuse to put you in jail and... And give me a chance to escape and kill me when I try. Yes. Mr. Anagallis, that should get you far enough away from Booker, but he'll never find you. I can't. Two men have been killed already. Booker's been able to get away with murder twice. He can't a third time. In fact, I know that he can't. Now you take that. I'm sorry I badgered you before. You pack your things. I'll be here tomorrow morning and I'll walk you to that stage. Someplace, Lila? Where is it? I don't know what you mean. The getaway money Cartwright gave you.
Oh, no, please. I'll give you half of it. No chance. Two hundred? No. Two hundred and fifty. I'll need fifty for the stage. You got yourself a deal. Fifty. You won't tell Booker. You promise. Yeah. Yeah, I promise. Five o'clock, an hour late. You know something, Booker? You really locked horns with a big one this time. Yeah, who's that? Ben Cartwright. I looked him up in the files of the Gazette. I didn't know you could read. Well, go ahead and make jokes. But there's nobody in Nevada bigger than Ben Cartwright. He can have the whole state right down on top of you. You sound scared. No. No, I'm not scared, Booker. I'm just smart. I know when it's time to move on. Orrin, why don't you go over to the saloon and get drunk, put it on my bill? I'll take care of Cartwright. Then you'll do it alone, Booker. You haven't said it all yet. Come on, what's the rest of it? Cartwright's got Lila. You're lying. I'm not lying. I did what you told me. I followed him. Took him a while to find her, but he found her. She ain't going no place. Booker, Ben Cartwright's gonna walk her to the stage in the morning. And if you try to stop him, he'll have the attorney general here. Good luck. Oh, that five I borrowed? Take it out of my pay and what's left, send it to the Fargo Hotel in Sacramento. I've seen Ben Cartwright duck into an alley. It's good enough. Hank? Well, I've seen someone running. I didn't get a very good look at him. It, it might have been Ben Cartwright. It was Ben Cartwright. I guess it was. Sheriff Booker. What can I do for you? I want to see your gun. Well, can you tell me why? When I'm ready. Just give me your gun. Fresh cleaned. But it took me ten minutes to find you. In ten minutes you could have cleaned it twice. You're under arrest. Well, on what charge? First degree murder? You shot and killed Deputy Horn. <laughs> and when was I supposed to have done that? I don't try to be funny, Mr. Cartwright. You know when. I was crossing the street when I heard a shot. I saw you run out of my office. I went straight into the office. Nobody there but Horn. Shot in the back. You sure it was me that you saw? Positive. I wasn't the only one that saw you. I got two other witnesses right here. Uh, I seen you, Cartwright. Plain as plain. I'll swear to that. I suppose you saw me, too. I seen you. Well, it looks like I'm gonna need a good lawyer, doesn't it? You're gonna need more than that. I got to Horn while he was still alive. With his last breath, he said you shot him. Dying man's last statement and three eyewitnesses. I don't suppose it would do any good for me to say that I didn't do this, that I'm not guilty. Not a bit. Let's go. You mind if I uh, get my coat?
assure you, you know the mayor of River Bend, Mr. Corker Samuels. Councilman, Mr. Purdy. Mr. Slatter. Mr. Elmont. And of course, you know, Miss Holden. What are they doing here? We've been talking about you, Sheriff. These gentlemen know all about you. But I had to explain to them why you killed those two men you had locked up in your jail because they tried to help Miss Holden get away from this town and from you. I told them that I would help her get away. And because of that, you'd come after me and arrest me. Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow morning. For something I didn't do. You're lying. He's just trying to get out of the murder of Horn. Why, well, I got witnesses. Of course you have. That was a surprise. You're killing your deputy to get at me. But I was expecting something. And that's why we've been here, together, for the past two hours, waiting for you. Too. Same as me. Ms. Holden has agreed to turn state's evidence. In appreciation, the court will undoubtedly treat her with leniency. How about me? Uh, I could use her uh, leniency. Take it easy, we stay around, yeah? Yeah, I guess we could use another hand. 